Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I feel like after this conference, like I, this morning, I have like half an hour to save the world and give an answer to all of the problems that were raised. And <laughs> well, I'm not going to be the saver. <laughs> but I'm trying. Um, I did learn, I learned a lot of things to, uh, today, but I learned something very interesting. First, that Yad Vashem need to hire a hacker after Dr. Kozlovsky lecture, and second, that my son, who is 12, can do the job very good. <laughs> so, speaking about nepotism, yeah, uh, he can do it. I will speak today about education and Holocaust denial, but actually in Yad Vashem we are not straightforward confronting Holocaust deniers. It's not our job, it's not our mandate, and sorry to say, it's not really, really efficient to do it. Just to people who doesn't know, I have here the Yad Vashem law, which was, you have it everywhere online, uh, which was, of course, 1953, the Knesset, said Yad Vashem law, of course, a Holocaust denial was not there yet, because actually, eight years after the Holocaust, and of course, they, they started to do it, the law, many years, no, three or five years before this, nobody thought about Holocaust denial. So what we are in charge in Yad Vashem is to commemorate the victims, it's to collect, you, you have it also here, we are responsible about education, establish memo, uh, memorial, um, project and more and more and more, but we are not in charge of fighting Holocaust denial. Saying this, we are not living, you know, in a world of our own, even though we're Israelis, and we are aware of what is going on, uh, on outside. So today I will focus our education and non-education, but other uh, Yad Vashem work through the internet. I will focus on the internet, I will, will not focus on what we are doing in Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, I was trying to focus on our online uh, work. People are saying today, you can read it behind me and I'm speaking that, nobody actually needs educators anymore because you have all the data and the information via the internet or on the internet. Actually, uh, we think quite the opposite. We think that because we have so much data and information on the internet, the educator is becoming more and more important because we are the one who have to be, I didn't mention that I'm working <laughs> in the International School for Holocaust Studies in Yad Vashem, sorry, even though it was written. We have, we think that the educator role becoming more and more uh, important. And as you can see uh, behind me, we're speaking about knowledge, we're speaking about values. I know this is a kind of old fashioned to speak today about values and about moral values, but we are trying, I would say, to plant the seeds in our uh, students. In a way, I think, even though it's a high world, we are trying to immune them. And we are really, really hoping, as educators, you will see, it, you have to be kind of a believer. We are really, really hope that one day when they will encounter uh, propaganda, or when they will in encounter group who shouts and said something, and well, they will encounter the friend in school attacking someone else because he is other or considered to be some kind of other, they will act out. And I have to say that at least at my home, and again, my son, he is 12, I think it's working because, you know, I, I work in Yad Vashem, so I nudge my son since he was born. And actually, a, a year ago, I was very, very, um, I have to say, proud as the education because he came back from school and he says everybody in class was saying one thing. But I remember that you told me that when the word everybody is out there, I have to think for myself. You know what, Ima, mother? I was thinking to myself, and I think they were wrong. And I said, well, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Uh, there is a hope. But of course, we are not encountering only on hope. Uh, we are working, actually, I would say, in two main paths. First, we are providing and discussing, fact, discussing facts. I will show you this in example. Again, we are not encountering Holocaust denial. Like we are not taking Erwin, Air who says, 
this and this doesn't happen, we are saying a uh, Yuda Bauer uh, um, video lecture saying, well, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is right, this is right. No, but we are bringing facts. And as I think again, Dr. Kozlovsky was referring, and Eli here, a Cohen was referring to, we are referring more and more internet today is pictures and it's video. And we are working more and more with pictures and with video while thinking about the next generation. This is the tablet generation. I mean, wherever they walk, it's unbelievable. Like I think my son have five different tablets. iPod, Asus, iPad, wherever they go, they have this monitor with them and that. Which by the way, it's not that bad. People think it's really, really bad, but since I am a historian, I remember when in my first degree, I studied Middle Ages, and our professor was reading us a 13th century manuscript where the priest says, nowadays generation, they are not educated, they are so stupid, I mean, so okay, I'm not thinking this. I think, by the way, they are much more, um, kids today are very fast, they, ca they catch things very fast. We have to know how to approach them. They don't have to know how to approach us. us. And this is, I think, very, very important. As I said, we are working with data, which I'll show you in a second, and we are teaching various thematic episodes of the Holocaust, encouraging students to think. I know it sounds very old-fashioned, but we really try our student, and by the way, when I'm saying students, and concerning Yad Vashem work, it's also teachers. We are trying to encourage them to think, and to think by themselves. This is very important, and again, we're speaking about values. As I said, I can't, I can't tell you that education, I think or someone here says that even the law is not enough to combat anti-Semitism, so I can't say that education uh, it's enough, but we are trying. Again, first, if you think about education, I have to tell you a small anecdote. This is Israeli an anecdote. Uh, maybe it's people from Israel, it's kind, kind of a story who runs. It sounds like a Holocaust joke, but it's not a Holocaust joke, but it does say something. I have a friend who is a doctor, MD, and as you probably know, the uh, real estate now market in Tel Aviv is very, very problematic, okay? so he. <laughs> understand. So he was trying to rent an apartment in Tel Aviv, and the owner was um, 70, 80 years old, a, a Polish woman. And he wanted to be first online, because many people came to see the apartment, and he says, I'm a doctor. I mean, I'm an MD doctor. And she was saying, you know what? Mengele was a doctor too. <laughs> well, <laughs> this sounds like a like very like, like a Holocaust joke, and it is a joke, but it's happened really. But you know, what is bothers me here is I can't tell you that education will stand against the next genocide, because as is written here, 60%, for example, of the Einsatzgruppen commander were university graduate. 30% of them had PhDs, okay? So to say that there were ignorant people who didn't finish a primary school will be very easy. I mean, okay, if they wouldn't, didn't finish primary school, I said, okay, they were ignorant, they were idiots, they were idiots or whatever. No, 60% from university, 30% of them had PhDs. And PhDs, some of them from the humanistic fields, okay? They were educated, what we can term Hochdeutsch. The new literature, the new Wagner, the new classical music, Schiller, Goethe, okay? So it's, I can tell you that education is the barrier against the next uh, genocide. And as you can see, I'm not that optimistic. We've been through the last, uh, you know, uh, 20th century, we had Rwanda. We had Bosnia, we had a, a Congo, by the way, if, if nobody actually really speaks about Congo, we had Sudan. Yeah, it's, it's going on. I'm not, by the way, comparing to the Holocaust now. I'm not getting into this discussion at all. I'm just saying that what happened in the Holocaust and education after the Holocaust did not prevent genocides. Not to mention the fact that we know exactly what is going now in Sudan, 
It's not like in, during the Holocaust we can say that people didn't knew, they did, they didn't, whatever. We have the internet, we have the media, we know exactly what is going on. Nevertheless, as I said, we should believe that through Holocaust education, which I will say a few words about it now, someone, my son, other people will stand and will say no. This is illegal. This is immoral. I'm not willing to take part in this. And this is what we are trying to do. To tell you that I will succeed, I don't know. To tell you that I'm hoping, I am. Otherwise, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. A few words about a Yad Vashem database. We have, uh, by the way, concerning the hackers, Yad Vashem is one of the, the most, at, um, at the side that I think is more attackable than all the Mossad, the Shabak, the government, whatever. But we are, I have to say, doing a very good job in protecting our site. I'm working in Yad Vashem in the last 20, 12 years. Only 10 years ago, a, a Turk hacker managed to enter our site but that was the only and last time that someone managed to hack her to Yad Vashem site, and believe me, they are trying. So, uh, Nimrod, we still have hope, you know. <laughs> we are better than the Mossad. <laughs> 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 so, let's say a few words about our database. We have the names and biographical details of ap approximately 3.6 million Jews who murdered during the Holocaust. Why we don't have the six million? We do have 5.8 million names. Uh, we still have problems of putting all of them online because they are in lists. And Yad Vashem archives contain, contain sorry, 170 million items. We are still working on putting everything online. I know Ellie was interviewing me 10 years or six or seven years ago to the radio, and I was really young and innocent, or maybe tell it, ask me, why Yad Vashem hasn't put the entire names? And I said, it's only me. But we are doing a lot of work. We have all our um, photos online. Quarter of a million of photos from Holo the Holocaust are online today. We have our library, not everything, we have the titles online. We have archival list of Holocaust victims and transport. We are about to put in the few months all Yad Vashem testimonies online. Yad Vashem lost, by the way, its fears. You have institutions who are afraid to put all their treasures online. We don't find it to be our treasures. We find it to be Israel and the Jewish nation treasure. This is why we are not afraid, you know, that if you put everything online, Nobody will come to Yad Vashem, it's not the question. We are putting everything now online. Of course, it's take ma manpower and money, but uh, we are doing it. I wanna, show you, I wanna say something about YouTube. As was said here, YouTube is being used, or may I say abused, by uh, Holocaust deniers and others. We are working heavily on the last year on, on YouTube. We have YouTube in actually seven languages, Hebrew, English, Spanish, German, Arabic, Persian, and Russian. It's not, as uh, was mentioned here, it's not a coincidence that we have Arabic and Persian channels. We have our site, we have Yad Vashem's site in Arabic and in Persian, and of course in other languages. It's very interesting to see uh, the responses from uh, uh, these countries, but we do know that they are entering our site, they are entering YouTube channel, they are watching the movie and they read. Um, as you can see, well, I wanna show you one example. And again, about YouTube, we are using today internet, as was said here before me, is all about pictures and videos. So we are using the video in a way, in order, first, this is important. Second, through the videos, 10%, you can see here the data about the German site, which we, we launched only two months ago. 10% of the people who are entering our YouTube channel will enter Yad Vashem's site and will read more about the Holocaust. So in a way, it's important by itself, but it's also a gate 
for further information. I want to show you one example of a picture which we are using again. I'm not saying here, this is against Holocaust denial. I'm just putting the movie. It's a movie from Lipaya, from Lita. It's a rare movie. And I'm sorry, I'm the last one, and it's before dinner. I mean, it's not, it's not very easy, but it sh it, you will see it. Ooh, sorry. It's a mass murder of Jews from Lipaya and Lita. It has no voice. Exactly. That was the right pronunciation. Yeah. It was taken, by the way, by a German soldier, Wehrmacht soldier, who was there. Sorry. So again, I'm not saying against Holocaust denial, but this is original film from the Holocaust. And of course, you can find it in Google. Yad Vashem is doing in the last two years, again. I think this is very wise. We are working with Google. We have a joint project with Google. All, for example, our photo archives was done with Google. Our YouTube is synch synchronized with Google engines, and I mean, in, if you can't beat them, join them, okay? Not that Google, uh, you know, but as Ellie was saying, children, they won't go to look for materials concerning the Holocaust to Yad Vashem. First, because even though I think this is the center of the world, nobody, not everybody knows Yad Vashem is the center for Holocaust studies, data, and commemoration, okay? Children go to Google. This is why we have to work with Google, and we have, to make sure, or we are trying to make sure, that the first results in Google will be from our result. They won't go to Yad Vashem site. They will go to look at in, in Google, but we want them to find Yad Vashem materials, or we are trying, which is, of course, very difficult to do, but we are trying. Um, again, educational philosophy, I won't have time. I can see that I have like eight minutes uh, I do want to show you a few Auschwitz album. Okay, I don't know if you know the story of the Auschwitz album. This is one of the rare uh, documents concerning the mass murder in, in Auschwitz. It was taken on May, May, June, actually, 1944, when the Jews from Hungary, 434,000 Jews from Hungary were sent to Auschwitz. Most of them were murdered there in 10 weeks. They were sent to Auschwitz. One of them, her name was Lily Yaakov Meyer. She arrived to Auschwitz from Karpato Rutenia. From an, our perspective, this is Hungary. Don't have time now uh, to explain. This is quite um, obvious. She came with her entire family. Her entire family was sent immediately to the gas chambers. Lily managed to survive Auschwitz until November 1944, when she was evacuated in one of the death marches who left Auschwitz. <laughs> there was not only one death march who left Auschwitz on January 18, 1945. The German began to evacuate Auschwitz in the summer of 1944. She was evacuated in one of the death marches, eventually liberated in Dora Mittelbau, which is a subcamp of Buchenwald. <laughs> Concerning of reflecting, by the way, before about the Hochdeutsch education, of course, Buchenwald is beneath Weimar, where you have the, uh, the Goethe Oak, okay? So you have Goethe, Schiller, and Buchenwald, where she was liberated by the Americans 
she had typhus. The Americans uh, uh, transformed one of the ex SS barracks into a hospital, provisional hospital. She was hospitalized there. She, because of the typhus, she was very cold. She, was, it was open, she opened one of the cabinets, and there she found this album. She opens the album, which looks exactly like this, the way you see it, and there she recognized the rabbi from her hometown. Then she recognized her brother, Zelig and Israel, who were murdered in that selection, that process, and then she recognized herself. She understood, I'm doing it very quickly, she understood that it was her own transport who's being filmed or actually photographed in this album. Only on 1965, when there was the Auschwitz trial on Frankfurt am Main here in Germany, which is, should be very interesting for you as lawyers, because when the Nazis were judged in Germany, the punishment they got was a joke, and this is an understatement. When they were uh, charged by the Russian or by the Poles or by the Americans, it was completely different, but this is really another story. Only in 1965, there was discovered that two SS men took these uh, photographs by the permission of Hess, not to confuse with Rudolf Hess, Hitler deputy, who died here in Spandau prison and was mentioned in, in Sergei, a lecture, but Rudolf Hess with the umlaut, who was an Auschwitz commandant who actually was hanged by the Poles in 1947, Hess permitted these SS pe uh, people to take these pictures from Auschwitz, we don't know until today, and we will not know why Hel Hess, sorry, permitted to take these pictures. That was Auschwitz album, 60 minutes, but uh, 60 seconds. But I wanna show you what we have here. This is from Yad Vashem's site. We have it in seven languages. Just a second, here. Auschwitz-Birkenau was the largest extermination center created by the Nazis. It has become the symbol of the Holocaust and of willful, radical evil in our time. The album you will see presented here is known as the Auschwitz album, and it is the only surviving visual evidence of the process of mass murder at Auschwitz-Birkenau. The album is unique. There is not a similar album of its kind in the entire world. The documents and photos from every direction and from every angle, the arrival at Auschwitz, the selection of those slated for immediate death and of the few who were destined to be slave laborers, the confiscation of their property, and the preparation for the physical annihilation of a transport of Jewish people. This transport of Hungarian Jews from the area of Carpatha, Ruthenia, arrived at the ramp of the extermination camp Auschwitz-Birkenau in May 1944. In the photos, we see the men, women, and children step out of the overcrowded train, traumatized and fearful after their horrendous journey. They have no clue that they have just been delivered to a death factory and that few of them will survive. Survivor and Nobel Peace Prize laureate Elie Wiesel described his arrival as a teenager at Auschwitz. Every yard or so, an SS man held his gun trained on us. Hand in hand, we followed the crowd. Men to the left, women to the right. Eight words spoken, indifferently, without emotion. Eight short, simple words. For a part of a second, I glimpsed my mother and my sister moving to the right. I saw them disappear into the distance while I walked on with my father and the other men. I did not know that at that place, at that moment, I was parting from my mother and my sister forever. The selection process carried out by SS doctors and wardens took place 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as train after train unloaded its human cargo. Most I'm sorry, I have to stop it. I know it's, because I have to actually, I have to finish, I know. Um, we have this in seven languages. No, actually now we have it in eight languages. Again, I'm not saying Holocaust deniers says that Auschwitz did not exist, that six that 1.3 Jews were not murdered in Auschwitz. You know this one who was a chemist, he came to Auschwitz gas chambers and he was showing that 
through the amount of the cyclone B that you have on the walls, it can prove that yada, yada, yada. I'm saying, okay, this is the album. This is the original album. In a way, judge for yourself. I'm not defending myself. I'm not presenting myself as someone who had to defend the facts concerning the Holocaust. We won't have time to see this movie, I'm sorry. I will do it very fast now. Again, this is, yeah, I'm finishing, one minute. Um, Auschwitz album. I will discuss it. If I will discuss, for example, the perpetrators. I'm, we are discussing the Holocaust as a human story. If I'm going to the one minute I have concerning education. I will speak about the perpetrators as human beings. I will show you it in a second. I will speak about the victims, but not as victims, not as corpses in Auschwitz. I will tell you as educator that their life story before the Holocaust, during the Holocaust, and after the Holocaust. We don't want them to be remembered as victims. They are victims, but they're before this, they're human beings who had life before the Holocaust, during the Holocaust. I didn't show you the film, but there is a love story there in Auschwitz. There are dilemmas in Auschwitz. You have human relationships in Auschwitz, different kind of relationship. You have people who are fasting in Yom Kippur. It's a suicide to fast on Auschwitz. But it, it, that was kept their dignity. This is what they felt, that they're still human beings because they're fasting in Yom Kippur in Auschwitz. So we are discussing it in our educational work. And what you see here in the, of course, I have like two seconds. We will discuss the mother who was due to Nazi ideology. She is designed to death because she is carrying a child, a baby, and both of them are designed to death, by the way, Look at her shoes. It's always amazed me. She's wearing a high heel shoes. Think about the way the Nazis mislead them. She's standing right now 800 meters before gas chambers two and three. But she thought that she is coming on the worst case to work somewhere on the East Shore. She, she's trying to look her best. This is the Nazi doctor. It's not always Mengele, it's always a Nazi SS doctor who performed the selection. Links recht, links recht, you can see his hand. He is a human being, he's not a monster. He's not an alien. It will be very easy for us as human beings if he was a monster. Because if he was a monster or a psychopath or a sociopath, it was very easy to us as human beings to say, you know, the Holocaust was performed by sociopaths, was performed by psychos, by monsters. There was, they were not human beings like us. They were human beings exactly like us. And this is what worrying, and this is what we have to keep in mind. And this is what education should teach us. Because Auschwitz happened, Auschwitz is a symbol, and it was performed by human beings and because we are human beings, exactly as them, we have to keep it in mind. You have here prisoners, we don't have time. Again, I brought you things from uh, Johann Paul Kremer, who was an SS doctor in Auschwitz. Just to read you one, this is his diary. September 42 in Auschwitz was the period when Slovakian, Slovakian Jewish women were murdered. Slovakian, French, and Belgian. Jewish women were a murder in this time, and he says, I was present for the first time in a special action, special action selection where you sentence people to death, but compassion to Dante, see, he's educated. Inferno seems almost a comedy. Auschwitz is justly, justly sorry, called an extermination camp. Three days later, at noon, was present at a special action of the women camp, Muslims. Okay, he sent here in this case, 1,200 women, Slovakian women, to the gas chambers. But then he says, because of the speci special ration that came with it, consists of a liter of liquor, five cigarettes, 100 grams of sausage, and bread, the men are eager to participate in such operation. Day after, today, an excellent Sunday dinner tomato soup, 
one half chicken with potatoes and red cabbage dessert and magnificent vanilla ice cream. In the evening at eight o'clock attended another special action outdoors. He is a human being, I know, it sounds like he's a monster, but he is a human being and we have to face it. Stanger, and again, I have to finish, referring to Gita Sereni, an Italian journalist who interviewed him. You know Stangel was commandant of Sobibor and Treblinka. And she asked him, would it be true to say that you finally felt they were not really human beings? And he says, cargo. They were just cargo. And because we teach in an interdisciplinary approach, I will give you now, and I will finish here because I don't have time, the other perspective, the Dan Pagis poem, you probably know, no, and he is a Holocaust survivor. They definitely were human beings. Lo, lo, and bechlet ayu bnei adam. Uniform, boots, madim, magafaim, how to explain, ech lasbir. They were created in the image, and in Hebrew it's even better, hem nivreu betselem. But then you say, I was a shade. They were the human being. I was the shade. A different created may, creator, sorry, made me. And look at this sentence, and I will finish with this. And he, in his mercy, left nothing of me that would die. Vehu berachamav lo eshir bishum davar sheyamut. In a way, he is saying, the Germans, the Nazis, who are human beings, manage, I would say, to sterilize the humanity in me. For Dan Pagis, in a way, this is the meaning of the Holocaust. And um, I have to finish, I know. <laughs> uh, I finished, uh, okay. So uh, this is, part. what I wanted to say is, to conclude, we are working with data, as I say, we are not confronting, sorry, Holocaust denier, but said, we are Yad Vashem, we are the expert. This has happened, this is, did, that didn't happen, no. We are bringing the films, we are bringing the data, we are bringing the documents, we are bringing the, 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 the names, Nazi documents, by the way, we do have a lot of Nazi documents. By the way, until three years ago, we didn't have German materials in Yad Vashem site. It was kind of unofficial decision, don't quote me in Yad Vashem, but we didn't really have it in Yad Vashem because of, mainly because of survivor sensitivity. But in this internet era, you can't ignore this. You have to have as many languages as you can, and this is why we have now a huge amount of material in the German language, which is very, very important to us. So we are working with data, and when I'm referring to education, I told you we're, work we're trying, I would say, to seed something which we hope will one day, I hope this day won't come, okay? I hope all of us will live happily ever after, and the utopia is already here. But <laughs> um, unfortunately, I don't think this is what's going to happen. And we really hope that through education, and I show you only a glimpse of it, children who are not going to be children or will be adults will say no, will come and say no, I don't agree. This is immoral. This is propaganda. This is brainwashing. Like my son came back from school, you know, you told me to be careful from the world, the word, sorry, everybody say. And everybody think. And you know what, Ima? I did find them to be wrong. So actually, this is what we are hoping for. Thank you very much.